Yo, awesome guys, welcome back to another video. I am feeling better. I'm still not 100%, but I'm feeling better. I've managed to get my earphones to work. I spent the last two hours trying to sort them out and connect them to my phone, to, to my phone, to my computer. We've finally done it. And yeah, from now on, I do feel a bit better. I know I said this about five days ago when I last posted. I thought I was getting better then I got worse. But I think at this point now I am getting better. And we're reacting to World War One from the from the American perspective, um, animated history from the armchair historian i've not reacted to this channel for a long time but when i watched it before i felt like i enjoyed it quite a bit and i saw this pop up and i thought why not check it out but um yeah hopefully you all enjoy this if you want some more reactions from this channel or some more similar topics let me know in the comments and yeah links are in the description to my patreon if you want some more reactions or to suggest me to watch some some videos that i can't post on youtube but let's jump into this and see see this video Captain Lloyd W. Williams can hear the sounds of combat. Men of the 5th Marine Regiment pick their way through Bella Wood, newly arrived to reinforce their flagging French and British allies. Suddenly, forms come bursting from the thick woods. The Marines raise their rifles, but instead of Stahlhelmed Germans, they find their lines swamped by battered French infantry. As their comrades retreat through the American line, a French colonel approaches Captain Williams, but his English is broken and unintelligible. The French officer gives a snort of frustration and pulls a notepad from his kit, scribbling a note. Captain Williams reads the proffered order before fixing his bayonet, uttering six words that will echo through the history of the United States Marine Corps. Damn. Retreat? Hell, we just got here. We just got it. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. George Washington, founding father and first president of the United States, famously advised the young country not to involve itself in foreign affairs. Few presidents seemed to take this advice to heart like Woodrow Wilson, who commented before his inauguration that it would be ironic if his presidency was concerned mainly with matters abroad. President hmm. Wilson's remarks would prove prophetic, as he was the anti-war isolationist who led the United States into the First World War. In this video, we will examine how the US went from a country that simultaneously declared neutrality but supplied the Entente to a major partner in the destruction of the Central Powers. For military historians, it often isn't enough to simply read about battles, soldiers, or campaigns. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a piece of memorabilia or a prized collectible is worth a whole shelf of books. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce the sponsor of today's video. Money, Goat he's getting his money. Goat guns? I've never heard of that before. Oh, you like build stuff and all that. Oh, you actually make guns. That's pretty interesting um yeah getting his bread you'd love to see it um yeah if you're interested links are in the description because this video is quite new so i feel like this ad is still in effect if you like the, site, the idea of building guns and stuff safe behind its twin moats of the atlantic and pacific the united states watched the development of the first world war with concern when hostilities broke out in July of 1914, American ambassador to France, Myron T. Herrick, advocated taking an active role in mediation. Expression from our nation would have great weight in this crisis. A strong plea for delay and moderation from the President of the United States would meet with the respect and approval of Europe. President Wilson called for neutrality on an existential level exhorting all Americans to observe neutrality in thought and in deed. To this end, the government prohibited American banks from loaning money to any belligerent nation, an act that the then Secretary of State and noted gold hater William Jennings Bryan hoped would both cement American neutrality and bring the war to a speedy conclusion. One How things changed, A fight they? with an empty war chest, after all. 
This fiscal neutrality was not long lived, as President Wilson reversed the decision in 1915 in response to the British Empire indicating their stockpiles of cash were about to run out, and thus they could not afford to continue buying American goods. Though protesting its neutrality at each turn, the United States was all too keen to do business with the Entente. With the metaphorical floodgates opened, American creditors sent a veritable Saved tsunami us, of greenbacks to the British Empire, who turned right around and spent that money in the United States. But the British were not the only foreign shoppers in American markets, as the German Empire too sought to buy critical supplies from Uncle Sam. With the Western Uncle Front grinding to Wait. a stalemate, Ger Uncle Sam is that is that like a a name for the U.S. Um. Uncle Sam. Meaning. Is it like the US? Oh, damn, it is. The more you know. Germany hired ships from neutral countries to ferry food and other necessities purchased in the United States to the continent. But British naval supremacy and their blockade. Wait, I, I've just clocked. They were selling it to Germany and the UK. Oh, so they were just making bread off everyone. They didn't care about the size. They were just making money. Fair enough. Empire 2 sought to buy critical supplies from Uncle Sam. With the Western Front grinding to a stalemate, Germany hired ships from neutral countries to ferry food and other necessities purchased in the United States to the continent. But British naval supremacy and their blockade of Germany prevented much of it from getting through. The United Fair States enough. formally protested the British blockade in March of 1915, but the issue was quietly resolved in a meeting that saw the United States accept a British prohibition on selling food to Germany. When the blockade began impacting American cotton exports and threatening a vital pillar of the economy, Britain agreed to increase their cotton purchases to cover the shortfall. The upshot of all of this economic backroom dealing was an ostensibly neutral United States bowing to any small pressure from the British Empire to stop selling to Germany. Between 1914 to 1916, American trade with the German Empire plummeted by an economy-shattering 99%. Germany, backed to an economic wall, ordered a submarine blockade of Great Britain in retaliation. The United States protested, declaring this to be a violation of international law. This double standard, accepting a British blockade of Germany but not a German blockade of Britain, it, I guess it sort of put, it made everyone realize what side they were gonna sort of be on. The neutrality sort of turned into being on one side. Was acknowledged and waved away by President Wilson who claimed that the British Navy did not threaten American lives in the same way that Germany's powerful fleet of submarines did. Wilson was unaware that Germany had only nine submarines with which to enforce its blockade, hardly the mammoth threat to American life that he seemed to imagine. But the threat was still there, as the sinking of the Lusitania on March 7, 1915 would throw into sharp relief. Sleeping giant stars. The sinking of the RMS Lusitania, which killed 128 American citizens, oh was my. only one in a series of incidents that drove the American people further and further into the Entente's camp. The American public, already displeased at reports of German atrocities in Belgium, condemned the apparent sinking of a civilian vessel, and a diplomatic back and forth between Washington and Berlin ensued. Calls to enter the war rang in the halls of the capital, stopped only by German promises to scale back their submarine operations. America was pacified for now, but German Americans began to face prejudice at home, prejudice that would only intensify as the war really? progressed. Doubts- that, that would have been a lot of people as well, because there's a lot of German Americans. Like, I don't know what, what the percentage is, but that's got to be- I think I've seen, like, maps, as, maps about it before, and German- People from other countries that like the, oh, I don't know what it's called. Their ancestors were from. I think the highest percentage of people from other countries is Germany and the US. And then like Ireland and stuff like that. But 
That would have been a lot of people. ...of German Americans' loyalty would be continuously raised. With President Wilson... Any man who carries a hyphen... Ha carries a a hyphen, I guess. That's wrong. Um, with him carries a dagger that he is ready to plunge into the vitals of his republic when he gets ready. Damn, Twitter back in these days would have been brutal, man. And declaring that any man who carries a hyphen with him carries a dagger that he is ready to plunge into the vitals of this republic when he gets ready. A nakedly <laughs> hostile <laughs> remark towards the largest non-English speaking group in the United States at the time. Government-stoked and homegrown paranoia escalated into violence, with German Americans shot, forced from their homes, or lynched, such as the case of Robert Paul Prager, a naturalized oh, wow. citizen who was lynched as a spy in April of 1918. This Jeez. hatred was further stoked by an incredible act of sabotage. As previously mentioned, the Entente funneled much money to Yankee businesses, including munitions plants. Germany, unable to buy American weaponry thanks to the British blockade, began sending spies to find where the Entente was procuring and transporting weapons and munition, and to halt the flow of materiel, if possible. One such point of departure was Black Tom Island in New York Harbor, and on July 30th, 1916, German agents decided to have a little fireworks show. Igniting over $20 million worth of stockpile munitions, the Germans oh, created shit. one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in human history. A shockwave equivalent to a magnitude 5 earthquake was felt as far away as Philadelphia. The what? Statue of Liberty was damaged, and Black Tom Island was devastated. 110 by 50 meter crater left behind by the blast. Momentum was steadily building for the United States to enter the war. And in a display... I mean, yeah, the Germans at this point are pretty much setting the US's sort of side for them. They're like doing all the stuff. And obviously they're doing it because they're probably annoyed because they're not getting any of the things from the US and the and Britain are allowed to get things from the US. But still, they're making it very easy for them to switch sides. ...of military acumen that would make von Bismarck proud, German planners determined that the best way to keep the United States from entering wars was to actively target their merchant shipping and threaten American lives. Their rationale was simple, bringing back unrestricted submarine warfare and sinking every ship headed to Britain, American or not, would starve the Entente into submission and end the war before the United States could even be moved to intervene. American ships were sunk, but President Wilson, just barely re-elected, continued to demur, instead proclaiming armed neutrality by ordering American ships to be armed and authorized to fire on any aggressor. As their ships were raided and more were lost, the American public began clamoring for more than just armed neutrality. President Wilson continued to resist, but his efforts Damn. were ended by the infamous Zimmerman telegram, an order by the German foreign minister to his men in Mexico to court America's southern neighbor with promises of recovering territory in Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico if they would invade the United States for the Central Powers. President Wilson, faced with all of these United States territory in Texaco, to court America's southern neighbor with promises Damn, the United so they, States for the central they got, power. They got them in like, they grabbed them by the balls and were like, you know what, we're going to do this to you now. President Wilson, faced with all of these pressures, asked his cabinet for advice and found a single word on all of his advisors' lips. Both houses of the United States Congress passed resolutions supporting a war on Germany and President Wilson formally requested Congress acknowledge a state of war had been created by Germany's actions rather than declare war outright. Congress responded by declaring war outright on April 6, 1917. Neutrality had ended, and it was time to go over there. Damn. And here we are at the start. The Yanks are coming. <laughs> The United States that entered the First World War was far from a military power. Isolationism had taken its toll on America's armed forces, leaving President Wilson to call up a minuscule standing army and dust off a navy of aging battleships. This, in a way, suited the president just fine, as Wilson believed the simple act of entering the war would tip the balance of power firmly in the favor of the Entente. 
While the British and French clamored for a fight to the finish, Wilson had his gaze fixed firmly on bringing the Germans to the negotiating table, and truly making this the war to end all wars. With the passage of the Selective Service Act, widespread conscription swelled the Americans' numbers, 2 million men had volunteered at the outbreak of war, and conscription would see 2.8 million more go over there. Whether volunteers or conscripts, Yankee troops began making their way to Europe. American troops landed on European shores in June of 1917. British and French commanders initially viewed the newly arrived Americans as reinforcements they could use to supplement their dwindling numbers. Some black soldiers, including the famous Harlem Hellfighters, were folded into the French army for the duration of the war. But General John Blackjack Pershing, infamous pacifier of the Philippines and commander of the American Expeditionary Force, sought to keep his men together in a unified American army. Pershing would largely get his way, and the first major engagement fought by the Americans would come the following summer, the Battle of Contigny. A German salient at the village of Contigny represented a golden opportunity to Pershing, who committed the 1st Infantry Division, better known as the Big Red One, to wipe it out. This strike would not only consolidate Entente lines, but Pershing hoped seeing the Americans in action would boost French confidence in their American comrades. At 6.45 a.m. on May 28, 1918, American infantry advanced under cover of French artillery. French tanks and flamethrower detachments advanced alongside the Yanks, and the combined force advanced up the slopes of Contigny. Despite the help of the French gunners, tankers, and air support, the Americans were mauled during the uphill battle, yet they succeeded in capturing the village. German yeah. counterattacks began not long thereafter, but the Americans held firm, turning back two days of offensives and keeping a firm grip on Contigny. The Americans accomplished their objective of not only taking the village, but also demonstrating that they could be counted on in a scrap. That scrap would come at Bellow Wood. A German offensive punched a hole in French lines, and the U.S. Marines were sent to plug the gap, pushing back the German assault and repelling numerous attempts to reopen the hole. From there, the Marines assaulted critical German positions in and around Bellow Wood, taking heavy casualties but accomplishing their objectives. It was among the trees of Bellow that Marine lore could be written. Captain Williams' refusal to retreat has become the motto of the 5th Marines. But Bella Wood and Contigny were only the prelude to the largest offensive. I love that. What an absolute badass man. Retreat, hell, we just got here. <laughs> what a guy, man. In American military history to that point. From September 26th to November 11th, 1.2 million American troops embarked on the Meuse Argonne offensive, aimed at capturing the railhead at Sedan. The offensive hit immediate stumbling blocks, as the Americans deployed inexperienced units already weakened by the Spanish flu. As the battle dragged on, both the Americans and the French sent troops to shore up the line. The Entente spirits would be lifted by an incredible act of heroism. Corporal Alvin York, a sharpshooting infantryman from the 82nd Infantry, now the 82nd Airborne, killed 25 and captured 132 Germans, a feat what? that would earn him the Medal of Honor. In a bid to break the stalemate, the Big Red One assaulted the German stronghold at Côte du Châtillon, an imposing position that American Lieutenant General Robert Bullard described thus. Not a line, a net, four kilometers deep. Wire interlaced knee-high in grass. Wire tangled devilishly in forests. Pillboxes oh in succession, one covering another. No foxhole cover for gunners here, but concrete masonry. Bits of trenches, more wire, a few light guns. Defense in depth. The mighty first was repulsed by this net, but their loss was quickly avenged by your friend and mine, Douglas MacArthur of the 42nd Rainbow Division, a patchwork of National Guard troops from states from Iowa to Alabama. The Guardsmen were able to succeed where the Big Red One failed, cracking Côte du Châtillon and turning the tide of the offensive, just in time for the armistice to be signed on November 11th. America would prove as active in peace as they were in the final days of the war. President Wilson brought his 14 points to the negotiations at Versailles, and pushed for these principles to provide the bedrock for the post-war world. 
Wilson envisioned a League of Nations that would promote global peace and provide a diplomatic alternative to fighting. Wilson also sought... Damn, I didn't know that, but I guess for Germany, that wasn't enough. They, they, wanted, them, they wanted more, so 20 years later, they went for it again. ...to impose his peaceableness on Europe as a whole, dismantling the old colonial system and promoting self-determination for all peoples across the world. But Wilson's ideas were not universally accepted, with the previously mentioned Secretary of State Lansing remarking that promoting self-determination would raise hopes which can never be realized, and that the phrase is simply loaded with dynamite. The British and French were equally skeptical, with the French representative only reading Wilson's points when the German delegation requested that they be the basis of the peace talks. Fearing that the Americans and Germans would conclude a separate peace based on Wilson's ideas, the French and British accepted the 14 points as Germany requested. Wilson became quite popular for his peacemaking image, and his League of Nations was formally established in 1920. But neither the Treaty of Versailles, which ended the First World War, nor the United States' entry into the League of Nations were approved by Congress, a sign that isolationism had returned to America's shores. America's hmm. war was over for now. Yep. Damn, what a video, Participation man. in the war to end all wars brought America onto the world stage in an unprecedented fashion, but the public's desire to return to a quiet isolation dashed any hopes that President Wilson had of his country leading the world into a new era of peace and international cooperation. The League of Nations would go on to crumble under the weight of its members' indifference to its decisions, specifically the open defiance of the Japanese Empire in the 1930s. German Americans came out of the war browbeaten into hiding their culture and assimilating. While before the war a full quarter of American high school students studied the German language, by 1918 only 1% of high schools even had German offered as a class. What? Ultimately, it would take another world war and a new president to see Lady Liberty take the center stage in world affairs again. Damn, man, what a video this was. This guy's channel is elite, man. I learned a lot from this as well. I learned a lot. It's important to note, too, that the Marines were among the few already battle-hardened forces the US sent. They had fought in the Battle of Veracruz early that year. I don't know about that war. Um, as well as many parts of the Banana Wars. I'd, I'd watch that in, um, I don't know, oversimplified, no. Um, G I don't know what that is. G -Y -S is that Sergeant Dan... De Dan... Is that Daly? Dan, I guess Dan Daly was already a two-time, I don't know all these things, MOH recipient when he fought the Battle of <laughs> the Bellew Woods. I don't know any of this. He told his Marines, come on, you sons of bitches, do you want to live forever? <laughs> God damn, these people are built different for real. But um, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this reaction. Definitely learned a lot here. And if you want some more videos of me reacting to this guy or other videos similar, let me know in the comments. And yeah, until next time, like, subscribe, and peace.